Now we discuss a very important fiber manufacturing technique, which is known as electro spinning. Hmm. So anybody who has worked in fiber manufacturing, not just uh, carbon fibers, but any fibers, polymer fibers for various uh, biological applications, drug delivery applications, membrane fabrication, anybody who has prepared fibers has definitely performed or at least heard of electro spinning technique at some point. This technique is indeed also commercially used. It has been used for over five decades. So this is a very well known technique and that is why you also have um, advanced versions of it and industrially for carbon fiber uh, fabrication. This is the most commonly used technique. Okay, so this is how the electro spinning setup looks like. Hmm. Okay, so this is a basic schematic. What do you see here? You see that there is some sort of a syringe where I have a polymer solution or it can also be a polymer melt. Hmm. So you have a syringe like structure. You can call it a spinneret. Hmm. And then on top of that syringe, there is a needle. Hmm. Needles are made of metal. Hmm. Syringe can be of plastic, but needles are typically made of metals. Now this syringe, you can also attach to a syringe pump hmm. just to push the solution, put, put, push your polymer out. Okay, so now you have a needle and on the other side, there is something known as collector. Hmm. These are your two electrodes. Okay, now what you're doing is as soon as the polymer comes out of the needle, you are creating a very high voltage difference. Hmm. And because of these electrostatic forces, now your fiber, your, uh, you know, the droplet that was on top of your needle will ultimately become very unstable and a fiber jet will come out of it. And that then that fiber jet then further splits into thinner and thinner fibers depending upon also the nature of the electro uh, of the electric field if you draw the electric field lines in, in inside your chamber mm. and then you will have this further splitting of fibers and then you will collect them onto the collector so it sounds very simple right it is indeed very simple so these are the steps that whatever i have just mentioned i have also written here basic principle of electro spinning okay so you actually apply a high voltage between two electrodes such that you create a voltage difference, a potential gradient. Your uh, collector is grounded. Okay. Now you have a polymer solution melt inside the syringe. E1 and E2 are the names of the two electrodes that I have written here. What happens is when you um, actually have this very, uh, uh, you know, uh, high voltage is applied, which are typically in the kilovolt, uh, um, you know, region. Mm. So. When you apply these high voltages, there are charges accumulated on top of that droplet, which is just coming out of your needle. Hmm. Why is it coming out of the needle? Initially, you gave it a little bit push. That is why you needed the syringe pump. Hmm. So you initially, you sort of just gave it enough push so the droplet came out and was sitting on, on, on the tip of your needle. Hmm. Now you created the electric field. And because of this strong electrostatic forces, now your, your, um, droplet you will see it sort of it is a it is a spherical droplet but then its tip suddenly starts to it, it comes out at some point it starts forming this conical shape this type of cone hmm, is known as the tailor cone so there is this tailor cone formation if you further increase the voltage what will happen now there are so many instabilities this tailor cone cannot remain in the cone conical shape uh, forever. So what will happen is that cone finally leaves a jet hmm, at certain threshold voltage hmm. and this then this jet as I mentioned further splits into various fibers. You can actually get nanoscale fibers easily using the electro spinning technique hmm. and in, in the case of our carbon fibers whatever fibers we are getting we are then performing the heat treatment they are also undergoing certain shrinkage. So it is easier to get nanoscale fibers using using this technique. However, you see that you're not collecting individual fibers. You see this uh, image I have made here fibers on a substrate. Hmm. So if I have this collector substrate and I have fibers coming from here, what I have on the substrate is sort of a mat, a fabric like structure. Hmm. They are not woven fabric. So weaving is something that we call when we are very, um, you know, in an organized manner, when we are weaving the ropes. Hmm. These are not woven fibers, but they are they are randomly oriented. Hmm. 
but there are a lot of fibers and typically you'll have several layers of such fibers depending upon how long did you perform your electro spinning and you you will have these layer of fibers and that would look like a cloth mm. so this is how your fibers will look like on a substrate okay what else um now think of what are the things that you can do with uh, or what are the parameters that you can control so number one you need to control the um, properties of your polymer how viscous is your polymer how much viscoelasticity it has and now in at the end of this lecture after the two slides i'm going to describe uh, the property viscoelasticity hmm. so that is number one that becomes very important it also becomes important what is the difference between what is the distance physical distance between the two electrodes hmm. okay also the characteristic voltage that is uh, just determined by each polymer so every polymer has a certain uh, you know range in which uh, this taylor cone will be formed and then the jet will be released hmm. so based on the nature of your polymer you will decide what is going to be your uh, what is going to be the voltage that you need to apply so this becomes an important parameter what is also important when you have the syringe pump what it is doing is once a droplet hmm, gets consumed mm. so you make five so there was one droplet in the beginning and you you keep on consuming the material right as you as the jet is going and you're collecting the fibers so now you need to refill mm. so you need to also uh, then give it a push so your syringe pump is basically pushing the solution through the needle and refilling and making sure that there is enough material for uh, for fiber formation the flow rate at which these um, uh, these droplets are released hmm. so basically the flow rate of your syringe pump that also becomes an important parameter okay now um, here you see that i have written something called far field or traditional electro spinning and then i made this sort of zoomed in structure where i show the taylor cone okay the one goal of that zoomed in structure was to show you the shape of the taylor cone and also you see a gray line there hmm, what's it called hmm, that is the collector what happens so if you see in this uh, jet that is formed initially if you zoom it in initially your fiber jet is like this one big thick fiber which then splits further hmm, and it becomes smaller 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 uh, as we go further but of course you cannot go too far from the collector also because then the uh, the, the the voltage difference becomes too low hmm. so there is optimum distance again depending upon what is the character, char characteristic voltage for the polymer you have that optimum distance between the two electrodes in the case of most of the industrial processes and most of the, uh, uh, our carbon fiber uh, precursor fabrication processes we have this distance between 10 to 20 10 to 15 centimeters that is a generally used distance but you can use anywhere between 5 centimeter to 20 centimeter in the case of the uh, the standard or traditional electro spinning or we just call it electro spinning you know that is the the standard or common form of electro spinning but there is then a variation of this electro spinning technique known as the near field electro spinning where as the name suggests the electrode is too close when you still have this one single thick fiber Hmm. if you place the electrode right there so close to the needle so you now have you can have higher voltage difference hmm. so it is the the the, volt, the it, it, even at lower uh, voltages hmm. so because the distance is, is so little hmm. so this variation is known as near field electro spinning why would we do that because in that case you get the single fiber jet so in that case you can practically write with that uh, with that uh, uh, fiber Mm. so then it becomes like a printing technique mm. you can also move your stage rather don't move the needle or the syringe you can move your stage and then in a controlled fashion if you move the stage you can perform controlled writing you can make controlled structures using uh, using fibers however the disadvantage of course is that because this is one thick fiber it is thick mm. so that is the problem it is a thicker fiber so if you want to get nanoscale fibers Hmm. then far field or the standard electro spinning is the one that uh, that you can use of course as i said that if you control the viscosity of the polymers if you control um, you know the elasticity of your polymers in that case you actually can get uh, various you can even pull very long fibers or very thin fibers from certain polymers in the case of carbon fiber manufacturing however 
near field electro spinning is not um, commonly used and for us what is more important is the bulk industrial carbon fiber fabrication so we only talk about the standard electro spinning this was just for your information that there are other variations that exist okay now this you will not use for um, this electro spinning technique is typically used for polymers but often it is not used for pitch however there are uh, papers where people have reported electro spinning of pitch pitch is more commonly used uh, uh, or spun using melt spinning hmm. okay yeah so this is one image of an electro spin fiber match and the, the polymer that was used here is uh, known as polyacrylonitrile or pen this is the most common um, precursor for carbon fibers that is why i've shown it here so this is how a mat looks like. So you can see this particular mat was uh, spun on top of a silicon substrate, so silicon vapor. Mm. And now you have this cloth-like structure. So if I pick it up with a tweezer, then the entire sort of cloth-like structure comes out. So this is an example. This is how your uh, fiber mat should look like after after electro spinning. Uh, for yeah, this is another optimization parameter would be for how long do you want to perform the electro spinning? How thick you want your mat? Hmm. So what are viscoelastic materials? You know that viscoelastic materials, they have two components when it comes to their deformation. Hmm. What One is the viscous component and the other one is the elastic component. Okay. What does viscous mean? It means that you have, um, you have permanent deformation. So this kind of behavior you will typically see from the liquids. And once a liquid is, uh, you know, it takes a certain shape, it does not come back to its normal shape. So in terms of deformation, this is the permanent deformation. In the case of, case of elastic materials, however, you have reversible deformation. So it's like a rubber band, you stretch it, it comes back to its normal position. So you know that this kind of behavior you see from the solids. Hmm. Now the question is, our very viscoelastic polymers, why do they behave like both liquids and solids? Hmm. So let's take an example of a semi-crystalline polymer. You know, in the case of semi-crystalline polymers, you have certain um, either the chain-like molecules or sheet-like molecules of the polymer. They are arranged. They are arranged in a certain fashion, but these crystallites are randomly oriented. Okay, so this is our semi-crystalline uh, polymer material. However, what happens is you also have some other polymer chains, hmm. maybe entangled a little bit, maybe not, maybe some small ones, some large ones. You also have other molecules of the same polymer which are in the amorphous region of the polymer. Hmm. So they are able to flow freely or relatively freely. Hmm. So this free flowing type material then behaves like a liquid while this material can actually undergo elastic deformation. What does that mean? That it means it will come back to its normal uh, position. So we have both components. Huh? So this is this is the um, you know example where you have semi-crystalline polymers. However, what if the polymer is not semi-crystalline? In that case, well, we know that polymers have these chain-like molecules and they can be very complex. You can have these chain entanglements which can make very uh, complex geometries. However, again, we have some not so complex geometries as well. Huh? We may have also chains that are not all of the same length. Hmm? So again, we have the same kind of, uh, uh, of structure. If you take one of, these, um, one of these entangled chains and you try to stretch it, hmm, then this will try to come back to its normal position because its entanglement points, the chain of the molecule will try to pull it back through the entanglement points. However, this part, which behaves like a liquid, this part is again, this is like a viscous liquid and this can, this can freely flow. So that is why you have both of these uh, behaviors in the case of a viscoelastic material, which is, which are predominantly polymers, also are a pitch and some uh, hydrocarbons, heavy hydrocarbons, petroleum products. They are also, um, they are also viscoelastic. Okay. Now, what we need to do is we, we would like to understand what is the overall deformation behavior of a polymer. So if I draw the stress strain curve, hmm, so this is your uh, stress Newton per meter square, and this is the delta L by L. Hmm, okay, so in this case, what happens? So you know that for any elastic solid, what happens? You have a stress strain curve that looks like this. Hmm. Now here, the slope of this line is your Young's modulus. Okay, so also in the case of polymers, what you have is you have this initial 
elastic region because we do have some elastic component of the deformation right and from here you can also determine the Young's modulus and in fact that is how the stiffness of polymers is often uh, determined and specified this is the initial elastic region what happens after that hmm. in the case of solids you will have you know you will have a yield point after your uh, your elastic region is finished right after that what you have is you have a yield point and then you may have at some point you will have you will have further deformation and fracture while in the case of polymers what happens is you then have a slightly different behavior and the curve looks something like this and the fracture actually happens much later hmm. you will have the yield point also in the case of polymers but in this region what you have is you have strain hardening hmm. so strain hardening also takes place in the case of uh, metals and other crystalline solids but the mechanism in the case of polymers is slightly different what you have here is the strain hardening is taking place because of the realignment or rearrangement of the chains okay so this is your overall um, you know this is overall uh, deformation behavior of polymers now let's see if we have some models some mathematical models to represent this kind of behavior okay so in the case of mathematical models what do you need you need sort of two components you need one elastic component let's take a spring hmm. and you need a um, you know a viscous component viscous component is represented by what is known as a dash pot hmm. or it is also called a damper in some cases okay so we have these two components and now what we are going to do in different models we are going to connect them as a circuit uh, element, you know, as circuit elements. We are going to connect them either in series or in parallel. Hmm. Okay, so the first model that we have here is known as the Maxwell's model. Hmm. Okay, in this model, you have both of your elements connected in series. Hmm. Okay, so this is your spring and this is your damper. Okay, now before we, um, you know, derive any equation for this model, let's, uh, let's see some very um, fundamental equations. In the case of elastic solids, what happens? You have the uh, stress proportional to strain and the proportionality constant is, is your Young's modulus. Let's call it equation number one. In the case of viscous liquids, what happens? You have your stress not proportional to the strain, but to strain rate. Hmm. And here your proportionality constant is eta, or this is what, what indeed is known as viscosity. Hmm. Okay. Now, since this is um, the component, the first one, the equation one is, let's say this is for our spring system and huh? this is for the, uh, for the elastic part. So I will have S, I, I, I write S here and this is one, the one which is for the dash pot. Hmm. Okay. So now let's see what is the overall stress and overall strain on the system in this model. Hmm. So now you can see that the overall stress, let's call it sigma total that is equal to the sigma on your spring element and also equal to the sigma on your dash pot. Hmm. However, that is not the case with strain. So the total strain is now the addition of um, the addition on the uh, this uh, spring plus on the dash pot. Hmm. So these are the two equations that you have. Okay. Now what we can do here, we can take the derivative of the second equation hmm, of, of this equation. So let's call it equation number three. Hmm. So we have this uh, derivative of this uh, entire equation, hmm. the epsilon total by, because why are we doing that? Because our goal is to find out what is the total uh, deformation of the system? What is the total strain on your um, system? Huh? So that is why we are taking the derivative of this. Okay. Hmm. Now we need to find out the values of different, uh, the different components. So, Let's, this this is our equation four. Now from equation one and two, we are going to insert some values here. If we see equation one, hmm, in that case, you see that um, you, if you take if you uh, take the derivative of this uh, equation one, what do you get? You get d of sigma s by dt, hmm, and that would equal e and d of epsilon s by dt. Hmm. This is the value we wanted, huh? d of epsilon s by dt. Hmm. So what is it? This is 1 by e d sigma s by dt hmm. and the second one the value of the second term that we can easily get from here we already have the value hmm. so this is basically sigma d divided by eta 
Hmm. So this is your equation. This is your model. Hmm. Now you can make some other uh, modifications. You can, for example, uh, sigma here, sigma is equal to sigma s and sigma d. Both are equal to the total sigma. Hmm. So you can you can just uh, you replace these terms with sigma t or you can just call it sigma. But this is basically your equation. Hmm. You can, um, this is your model number one. Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about model number two. Hmm. Model 2, we are, I'm not going to derive it because again, it is uh, it is very simple. The only difference is that here both components are not connected in series. They are connected in parallel. Hmm. So what will happen is now your stress value will be the addition. So total stress on the system will be the addition of uh, the stress in, um, on each component. Hmm. While the strain will remain equal. Hmm. So sigma s, uh, sorry, it's epsilon s will equal epsilon d will equal the total epsilon or total strain onto the system. So you can solve this one for yourself. This second model is known as the Kelvin White model. Hmm. Okay. Now the model number three, this is kind of a combination of the two models. You have a spring and then, so then in series you have this spring dashboard system connected to it. Hmm. So again, you can solve this model for yourself. This model is known as the standard linear viscoelastic model. Hmm. So standard linear viscoelastic model. So you can uh, you can solve all these models for yourself. And this is now the point is that there is nothing like which model is good and which one is bad. It's more about what is the type of your polymer. Hmm. Do you have a very what is the you know viscosity component of your in your polymer? What is the um, elastic uh, component in your polymer? Depending upon that, which will depend, of course, upon the properties of the polymer, how many, what kind of chains you have and so on. And that is how you will find out which model is more suitable for your system. Now, I would like to also quickly tell you how do these models actually represent the deformation? Hmm. So if I apply a certain force onto this polymer hmm, for a given time t, hmm, so I apply the force. And then I apply it for, I hold it like that and then I release the force. In that case, what will be, what will be the deformation, uh, what, how will the deformation look like according to each individual model? Hmm. So in the case of your first model, which is your Maxwell model, you will have certain um, elastic deformation in the system in the beginning. Okay, then there will be a linear change in the properties or in the deformation. And then after you, you, when you release the force, then what will happen is this elastic part will come back. Hmm. So whatever is the magnitude of this part will be the magnitude of this part. And then you will have a relaxation. So this is how your, this is how the deformation will look like as per the model number one. Now what happens in the case of model number two, it indicates that there is a certain, so the, the deformation is not linear. Hmm. And also the relaxation is represented like this. Hmm. So this is your Kelvin White model. This model is very good for representing, for example, creep in the system. Okay. In the case of third model, it looks something like this. So you have an elastic component in the beginning. Hmm. Then you have this kind of behavior. So you do have a certain creep in your system. However, after you release the uh, the load then you have again the same magnitude hmm. you have the elastic component coming back but then you have a relaxation mechanism so this is your your third model okay so as i mentioned before that according to the nature of chemical properties of your polymer you can select the model that is suitable for you 